our dear rotarian friends we are here today to give our first award for the year 2020 as we are all aware that the corona pandemic has created havoc in the world since the beginning of this year so it was but natural that the first award should be given to the frontline warrior of this covid and therefore the first award that we chose to give is a bravery award and it gives me immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Mufazil Lakadawala, who is the recipient of this award. Dr. Lakadawala is qualified as a Master of Surgery from Mumbai University and has taken advanced training in bariatric surgery in Cleveland, USA, Belgium, and South Korea, Seoul, Korea. He has formed Digestive Health Institute and is a chief bariatric and GI surgeon there. It is the first Indian Center for Excellence for Bariatric Surgery. He is also chairman of the Institute of Minimal Access and Surgical Sciences and Research Center at Saifi Hospital, Mumbai. He is Professor Emeritus at BYL Nair Hospital. He is also surgeon to the Honorable Vice President of India. He is the President of International Federation for the Surgery of Obesity and Metabolic Disorders, seven, year 1719. He's a board member of Asian Endosurgery Task Force. He's a founder president of Asian Consensus Meeting on Metabolic Surgery. He's elected as international honorary member of Japan Society of Endoscopic Surgery and Korean Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. He has won Best Surgeon in the World Award by American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. He's a master educator of the World Award by International Federation for the Surgery of Obesity World Congress. He has won Rotary Excellence Award in February 18, Lokmat Maharashtrian of the Year in the year 17, Rotary International Award for Young Achievers. He has won Humanitarian of the Year Award from All India Human Rights Association. He has presented a number of papers at national and international conferences and has initiated many, many charity initiatives in India. In March 2020, as the COVID crisis deepened, Dr. Mufazal Lakadawala, who is one of the India's now leading bariatric surgeons with a thriving private practice, volunteered his services with the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai to help contain the spread of the pandemic in his beloved city. What began as an advisory service has now snowballed into one of the largest COVID positive, COVID positive facilities in Mumbai with Dr. Lakadawala leading the team. With Dr. Lakadawala's expertise, a contactless and safe clinic was executed and made operational at NSCI Dome in a short span of five days. With more than 500 beds, NSCI is presently one of the largest COVID positive facilities in the Mumbai and it is mainly for the patients who are exhibiting mild to moderate symptoms of the COVID. This is also the first center to use X-ray and artificial intelligence, which can help predict whether the disease is likely to worsen and contain it easily. With this kind of meritorious service, Rotary Club of Bombay is extremely proud and privileged to present him the very award of the club. I may now read the citation of the award. The Rotary Club of Bombay is pleased to present its bravery award to Dr. Mufazil Lakrawala for going far beyond the call of duty at, his, at this time of crisis, for safeguarding the lives of the sick and needy even while risking his own, for giving new meaning to the words frontline warriors, signed by our president, Dr. Rotarian Pramros Mehta. I may hand over now to President for the presentation of Silver Sliver. Thank you very much, Swati. Uh, Dr. Lakhawala, it is our pleasure to present to you the citation and the Silver Salvo. I'll just put it up here. I hope everyone can see it, right? We will be sending it to you shortly and it reads, Rotary Club of Bombay Bravery Award awarded to Dr. Mufazal Lakhnawala for his exemplary service at the time of crisis. Thank you so much. And it is our pleasure and honor to have you here with us today. Uh, may I please request you now to address us all. 
Thank you. Uh, it's a huge, huge honor. And out of the many awards, uh, President, that uh, Swati mentioned, probably this one's special because uh, little did I ever dream of in my wildest of dreams that I'd get a bravery award for being a doctor. You know, you've heard of bravery awards for police people, for uh, military officers, and for various other branches, but rarely ever for a doctor. And I think the reason why this is, is because we were probably the only ones who ought to have been on the front lines for this war against the, the coronavirus. And I'm glad I, I had a small little part to play in saving the lives of many, many Mumbaikers. So uh, what can I say? It, I just couldn't stay at home and watch this uh, pandemic kind of hit my area, which was Worli to begin with, and burn my city down, the city that I love. And I, I was just not ready to uh, wait on the by, bylines and, and watch this uh, unfold without being having to uh, play any role in it, right? Now you would, as she said, read out my citations, I was, I was wondering that y'all would all wonder what the hell is this surgeon trying to do save lives in Corona? Because he's not an infectious disease specialist. He's not an intensivist. He's not even a respiratory physician. Uh, I think the more we've learned about Corona, the less we know about Corona. And what we've realized is that everyone from the WHO chief to the ICMR chief to Mr. Fauci, as great as he is, knew very little about this virus when it started. So all of us as doctors were as qualified as the, the other guy who was trying to figure out how to save lives, all right? So I said, why not? Why not give it my hand? And I put my hand up and I must really take this award on behalf of a lot of people. Firstly, on behalf of all those brave nurses who risked their lives, they were all, uh, untrained nurses, so they are not even qualified. I started with a group of 24 nurses and they were not even, they had not even cleared their uh, nursing college. And I'll tell you how this unrolled. Uh, I, all the doctors, all the physiotherapists who behave like doctors and became doctors actually during the course of this and helped me through the journey. A special thanks to Mr. Aditya Thakre because without his support, I wouldn't have been able to make NSCI Dome what it is and what it's lived up to be because he kind of backed all my wild ideas from uh, ICUs and containers to everything else. And we all do know without political backing, it's very, very difficult. To the municipal commissioners from Mr. Parveen Padeshi to Shahid Ugre to Mr. Iqbal Chahal, I thank them all because without their support, this entire journey wouldn't have looked as good and rosy as it does right now. But mostly uh, to all those various, various patients who kept a smile through all the difficult times that they did have to face with us, right? I had a few things when I started this entire journey. The first and most important thing was to drive away fear because fear was one thing that was killing more people than the disease actually. You know, it was like straight out of a movie scene. The sirens would blur. The moment you came to know you were positive, even your best closest friends who stay away from you. They would suddenly run away from you. In March and early April, we were all so scared of this disease that very few people were ready to venture out and come out onto the roads. And that's where I realized that I firstly had to drive away this fear. The next thing was stigma. There was huge stigmatization. So the municipal officers would come, ambulances would take you away from your families. You didn't know whether you'd stay alive and come back and see them or whether you'd probably never see them alone because the myth was that if you were old, above 60 years of age, if you were diabetic, there was very little chance that you'd survive. That's what everybody thought. The other myth was that, oh, uh, let's start inhaling uh, steam. Let's start having all forms of hot gargles and everything and this disease will prevent us. Now we've known that hot climate all these various gargles, all these various teams have done little to save lives. Uh, if at all, they have managed to probably just clear out your nose so that you can breathe a little better. That's, that's probably as much of curative effect they've had, if any. So uh, when we started the journey, I had to think out of the box. Now, the first time when I, when I looked at the NSCI dome, we have used to seeing it as a rock star stadium where we've heard music concerts and various other things. And uh, I told the municipal commissioner, G. South, Mr. Ugre, that I think this is a great facility to convert because we'll soon run out of hospitals. We will not have any space. And he said, sir, uh, and I said that give me five days and I'll convert this. So we divided it 
straight up into sections where one was for ladies, one was for gents, uh, one was for the old people, and one was a section which we had completely isolated for the high risk. So all those who needed oxygen, and because NSCI dome already had these cameras, which were like very, very uh, high tech cameras, I could zoom into the finger of a patient and monitor his pulse oximation uh, right from having him on bed. And that's how our journey started. And that's how we managed to save a few lives. The next thing that I did is because there was not too much money to play with. So I thought of simple measures. I read about autopsy report on 50 patients from Italy, which said that what was killing people was tiny little blood clots and microthrombi. So I started putting all of those patients above 50 years of age, all of the patients who were diabetic, all uh, on blood thinners. And that's a 350 rupee injection, which I got again with support from a lot of the Rotarians like yourselves and from a lot of other CSR initiatives. And we started putting all these patients and that's why our mortality rates were shockingly, extremely low. We use surveillance and we use this. Another thing I, I had promised all the nurses when they joined me, these 24 nurses, along with a group of seven doctors to manage 500 patients when, when you're managing them right in the beginning, out of which four were physiotherapists, one was a surgeon like myself, one was an intern, uh, that I will be the first one to get infected with this corona, if at all, I will protect you completely. So in the beginning, I would go in uh, with a PPE suit for 10, 10 hours. And it's extremely difficult because I use completely stringent uh, guidelines. So I would not allow anyone to go and take a bathroom break. No one was allowed to drink water. No one was allowed to take a coffee break, nothing. So they were in those PPE suits. Uh, and once you get into a PPE suits for even 10 minutes, you will realize how torturous it is. Because those times we used to use PPE suits that came from Taiwan. And these had a PSM that was more than 200 so that we were too completely protected. Uh, and now, of course, we've come down to the 60s and 90s, which are more breathable suits and which are available. As those times, that was not available. So when you came out, actually, there was a process of donning, where you wore these suits, and doffing. Doffing, we created a buddy program. So what I did is I told two people to come out together so that one would observe the other, people uh, the other person remove the PPE, because that's the most important thing. Uh, because sometimes you make mistakes and the steps are not looked after. And I can proudly say that all these tiny little steps that we took actually made sure that not one doctor, not one nurse was infected in the five months that I ran NSCI door. And I think that's something I'm much, much more proud of than of the number of lives that we've actually saved. Because if you lost one healthcare professional to getting infected, the morale of the entire team came down. And that would, as it is, we didn't have too many people to fight this uh, war with us. The other thing I created was the contactless clinics. Uh, so I first thought of putting the doctors in a separate space and the patients in a separate space. Now, because this was a centrally air-conditioned place, it was impossible to put them in separate places. So I created cubicles which had separate air conditions. So what would happen is when a doctor went in with the PPE suits, he was, as it is, very, very anxious. He was sweating away to glory. His, his glasses were fogging up. His screen used to fog up. And he was irritable. The nurses used to be irritable. The patients didn't get much time with the doctors. And we had like probably two doctors uh, to watch 500 patients at shifts because we used six, six hour shifts. And we had maybe four nurses in various shifts to watch over a group of at least uh, 100, 150 odd patients. So it became very difficult to personalize attention. So what we decided is let's not look at the ones who were low risk, who had mild to moderate symptoms. Let's concentrate all our, all our resources on those who were serious and those who needed complete care. And that's where we started using hand wearable devices. So we use IoT uh, devices wherein the, the thing would come onto my, my phone or my computer screen and I could tell them when a patient's saturations were dropping and we would move that patient, uh, zoom in, get that patient onto oxygen and save that life. Another thing we did is uh, I thought of, uh, because I, NSCI was not a hospital. So how would I create ICUs there? So I thought of ICUs in shipping containers. Now, when I set up these ICUs in shipping containers, I also thought of how to reduce contact time because that's the space where maximum aerosolization of the virus would spread. So I thought, how do I reduce this contact time between the doctor and the patient? And the patient is, so first I created these oxygen hoods that patients wore so that 
They would be bathed in oxygen and high floor nasal oxygen save patients. The other idea of actually I was I was kind of castigated on Twitter by some people who didn't really know medicine and science as to why I was suggesting these jumbo massive cylinders to come up. Because when they asked the BMC engineers in Nair, KEM, Cyan to begin with, how much oxygen do you need per patient? They said between five to eight liters. And I said, I need 60 to 80 liters per minute per patient. And so they thought I was completely crazy. So the engineer came back to me and said, sir, aapka zero mein kuch hua hai. So I said, no, this is what I need. And that's when we realized that these ideas came up. So the first jumbo facility in India that came up was at NSCI Dome, where 500 patients, where the idea was to set it up in a huge open space. That was the first with NSCI Dome. The second was these massive jumbo oxygen cylinders. And now we do know that everybody's written about it, that India's actually importing oxygen from abroad because we don't have that much oxygen to save these lives. So these were the two ideas that really clicked and really set into motion. Then we had BKC, we had NESCO, and various other facilities that came up because I set up a guideline of setting up these facilities for, uh, for BKC. And I came on more as an advisory role. I had a lot of young doctors and I must really credit them because they were, they were really brave and they were more braver than me. I think the, big, the bravest of the lot is these nurses because they would go in every single day wearing these PPEs without flinching at all. I've had girls, young girls, 20 something year old girls actually throwing up in the PPE out of oxygen. Some of them fainting in our hands and we having to bail them out. All this drama and action has happened uh, whilst we were at the NSCI dome. Uh, the other thing, what I, what I noticed was that if you displace fear, you manage to save yourself. You know, the irony of it all says that in those five months when we were there, when we went in every day, fearlessly roaming around, people came in wearing masks and shields and gloves and everything when they came in to take up a job with us. Uh, and I can say Rahil was one of them when he came in first to see us. He saw, we saw him with all these various things. Eventually, I think people kind of realized that Though there were corona patients inside, it was not that much of a, a problem. And we were all walking around as if it was like common. We used to wear our masks, but that was it. We never wore gloves. And I'm, I was always against wearing gloves because unless you were touching patients physically inside, it was no point wearing gloves because with the glove, it was a false sense of security. You would touch your face thinking that you're sterile and you would not sanitize your hands that many, that often. And what we did is we, I would just insanely sanitize hands very often. Uh, the other thing was to take the morale of the entire team and, and go along. So we would, we would organize these various things where we would keep pepping up people who were a little down and it almost became like a family. And I, I must really thank all these people for being part of this journey because whilst we were there, none of them got infected when they left. Unfortunately, they kind of let their guard down and a lot of them picked up Corona, but we are still very, very close to all of these people. And luckily we, we didn't manage to lose any of our frontline warriors during this journey. I think uh, what we must also thank is the, the hordes of police officers because there were lots and lots of them who actually have succumbed to this disease. A lot of the BMC officials have succumbed to this disease. All came on very bravely right at the front. I remember the, the first time when we had the cyclone, we had 260 patients shifted out of BKC because they feared that the tents might get blown away because of the velocity of the wind. And then within, within the space of three hours, we, we accommodated 260 patients in NSCI Do. Uh, we, we stayed up that whole night to try and make sure that everyone was comfortable. The other, other torrid time we had was when the, when the uh, rains, really the first big rains that we had in Bombay and Mumbai was flooded out. The wind's velocity at NSCI blew out the entire covering and we had electricity disruption. And I remember I had 16 ICU patients. I stayed up the whole night along with my team to make sure that we didn't have to shift any of these patients. We temporarily made oxygen available for uh, 16 beds inside the dome and moved all these patients there till morning, till we had backup. Another time we had when in uh, two of the uh, I think the servers, I don't know what do you call it, the electricity, uh, this thing blew up on us. And the entire dome was being run only on one. And we were wondering what would we do if this blows up. So we had 20,000 liters of diesel uh, driven into NSCI so that the generators would back up till morning so that we would not have any fatalities. Well, uh, I think I've said 
quite a lot during this my my this journey i uh, must thank my my wife because she was fully pregnant when i jumped into this journey without her even without me even asking her can i go can i not go she was 5 months pregnant when, and she delivered when i was in the icu i was i was yanked out of the icu uh, saying that your wife's been calling you and because you can't pick up calls there so when i went anita had supported me the other two people i completely forgot to thank him which luckily i remembered now is dr neeta varti because she came on board and we took in all the pregnant ladies right so we took in all the pregnant ladies and we became the first ccc2 facility to take in uh, everyone from being uh, two months pregnant to nine months full bone pregnancy because there was a lot of uh, discrimination against them initially then we had i had to thank dr arjun and dr pankaj from tata hospital initially nobody was ready to take these cancer patients so i said we will we will join hands so they would come in every day we have treated over 300 cancer patients at the nsi i don't while i was there without one mortality and i think that can be some kind of a record because i've heard that the mortality rates are pretty high with cancer patients with covid and we didn't have one mortality also so i think that is great support to the team of tatas that worked very very tirelessly with us through this entire journey the municipal officers of g south ward there was no day no night nothing sometimes we are used to blaming them for all the potholes and various other things that we are we played with on the roads of mumbai but this is one time when we stood shoulder to shoulder and fought this battle without fearing i have entered slums i have entered houses and seen that the tiny little slum pockets in mumbai that we have in worli in in worli kolivada and various nagars adarsh nagar and various other things of worli where even sunlight cannot make in roads so it's impossible to maintain social distancing so sometimes when we say it's very uh, great to say let's maintain social distancing but it's impossible for these slum people to do that i am quite glad that we didn't lose as many uh, in this war as some of the uh, famed econ economies of the world or some of the famed medical structures of the world i think the one thing that people have asked me before what differentiates doctors here from the doctors probably abroad it, it skill sets can can vary up and down we've got the best here we've got the worst there as well i think one thing is the heart i think most doctors here have a heart and they'll be ready to risk their lives uh, to save yours and uh, i think that's what we set out to do i'm glad we could make a success out of it thank you so much again for this award uh, it will stay very very close to my heart because like i said this is the first ever time that i've got a bravery award and uh, this will go down with me thank you so much thank you thank you very much of lagrawala that was truly an eye opener and we are very grateful to have you here with us today uh we take a few questions if you don't mind yes please satyan can you ask your question please yeah sure uh dr lagrawala uh first of all we are really grateful and thankful for your service you have done a splendid job uh i had a question on a lighter note of late there's been a school of thought that the ipl has a role to play to reduce the number of covid cases what do you have to say to that uh, because ipl's put everyone in a bubble the bubbles <laughs> in dubai and abu dhabi as well as the bubbles in their own houses everyone so glued to their tvs that nobody wants to venture out <laughs> so i think i think the bubbles helped okay um murit you had a question yes uh, congratulations dr lakhawala once again superb service by you my question is What is this long COVID, uh, which is surfaced in Europe, uh, Doctor Lakhtawala? What are the after effects of people who have got COVID? If you can shed any light on that, please. Yeah, this is something that we've learned that COVID not only kills in an acute phase, but actually is doing more and more harm in a longer term. Right? <laughs> It's got long-term sequelae that we are now discovering as more and more people are coming up. A lot of people initially were scared of getting reinfected. Now we do know that is happening. across the world but the, it's extremely minuscule and we've realized that the people who are getting reinfected probably are not dying because of that reinfection okay there are rumors circulating but don't believe these rumors around it the other thing is uh, like you mentioned whether you want to call it long covid or covid with long term sequelae it has uh, sequelae like fibrosis of the lung all right um, uh, so if we we monitor these patients very closely uh, what one thing that can save you is steroids 
the use of steroids during the acute phase of COVID, especially if your CT scan has got scores which are pretty high or your X-ray images show something which is very high. The other thing is uh, to, uh, people have died out of sudden heart attacks or had neurological problems suddenly uh, within, within a month of completely recovering from COVID. That is only because they've not been on blood thinners. So we do something, despite being the inflammatory markers like the D-dimers and the, uh, the ferritins and the LDH and, and various other tests, D-dimer is one test that we use to figure out the, um, the capability of your blood to clot. Yeah. So if your D-dimer is on the higher side, I would recommend that please be either on an injectable blood thinner or an oral blood thinner for at least close to 21 days to a month. And that's what I've recommended to all patients. So I think this will prevent a lot of the long-term immediate long-term as well as the longer, longer, long-term uh, sequelae. Physiotherapy, yoga will definitely help you once you've recovered from COVID. Ali, can I have a word after the next question? Dr. Daspur. Certainly, certainly. Uh, Ashish, contractor, yeah. you want a question? Yes. Uh, hi, Mufi. So Satyan on a lighter note said that the IPL has stopped the COVID infection. Satyan, I don't think you know, but Mufi himself is an excellent cricketer. He was a contemporary of Sachin, and uh, so what cricket has lost, medicine has gained. <laughs> so, so Mufi, um, great, great talk and absolutely great work. A quick question. In your day, day job, you're a bariatric surgeon, and there's a lot has been said about obese people having a higher risk uh, for COVID and of uh, dying of COVID. Did you find that in your uh, experience? Yeah, so we've all along known that obesity is a big killer. Uh, People have sometimes ridiculed when we say this, but I believe that obesity is a mothership of all diseases. And it's been proven even in COVID times. Worldwide statistics tell you that probably diabetes is not a significant killer alone as much as... So a non-obese diabetic would probably not die, but an obese diabetic would definitely die. And we do know that diabetes, type 2 diabetes and obesity come together. So yes, obesity has been one of the leading causes of one of the leading comorbidities if comes along with COVID that not only has had a high mortality, but high morbidity in terms of long-term uh, lung sequelae. And Ashish, I do believe you've started this program at RFH uh, where you've started post rehab clinics. I think it's very, very vital that physiotherapy and these things continue uh, at least in the next six months, even after the uh, uh, vaccine comes in. And we should not forget that it will leave scars. So rather, uh, leave a little smaller residual scar of COVID rather than leaving big scars. That's what I would say. Thanks, Mofi. Ali, can I? Yes, Ali? Adi, go ahead. Adi, go ahead. Hello, Rotarians. I've known Mofi for some time. And the secret of his success is, is literally the bravery which he has, the passion which he has for what he does. I mean, when he went into his specialization in the medical field, there was no one like him in the field he took up in bariatric surgery. And I'm seeing, seeing him with which passion he used to work at those days. And then it suddenly turned his head to this COVID problem. And I had a staff of mine who had a positive COVID. And I referred him to Breach Candy Hospital for treatment. And after 14 days, they controlled him and they sent him to the dome. And I didn't know Mufi was in the dome at that time. And the way he was treated there, he used to go to Worley for walks in the evening. He said, where are you? He said, he said, go me, go me. He saw, he saw, and there were such lovely people there. The staff was so good. He was so comfortable there. And he came back home, hale and hearty with a negative COVID test. So I know, and whatever he takes up, he does very well. So I wonder what he'll take up next. Rufi? Sir, uh, the one thing, one thing I would love to take up is to look as young as you. <laughs> <laughs> I do reach that. <laughs> I'll pass you on my Parsi gene. Yeah. you okay? <laughs> I, I, I did. I did know uh, <coughs> Professor Ali Nazir when he taught me, and he told me that camel's milk is the success to every Parsi, looking as young as he does. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, Goofy, you've done a brilliant job in this. And Rita Bharti was your assistant in the dome, and she also is a gynec who was my student, and she's very good in endoscopy work. She left her endoscopy practice and went to the dome to help you. So, I mean, the dedication in the dome. I think Dome D is for dedication. Uh, and it's a fabulous place you've made up. Please keep it on. And I hope till the COVID patients go away, the Dome stays. All the best. Mufi, God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Adi. Thank you. Uh,
SV, you have your question. Yeah, uh, first of all, Dr. Laknawala, hats off to you. I mean, uh, uh, truly touching and humbled by what you just mentioned uh, now. Uh, just a few quick questions. One is that uh, people say that uh, Indians seem to be touch wood less prone to COVID given all our challenges. Is there any scientific reason? Question number one. Question number two, in India itself, the, the men folk seem to be affected more by the, than the women folk, which is good in a way. And the third question is the age group 50 to 65 empirically in India seems to be the one that's most vulnerable. I, I would like your thoughts on all these three. Thank you. Thank you. And I think these are very, very significant questions. Yes, the case fatality rate in India looks like it's much lower. Even if we take into account that we probably don't count our numbers as well as some of the Western countries in the world. But still, I do believe because I've personally gone into the slums. I've personally visited all these places. So I do know that people are not just falling dead by the wayside, right? So we might be critical of our government sometimes when we look at numbers. But I do believe that I think we've uh, at least I believe that Modi ji has done a much better job than Trump has in terms of controlling mortality, whichever way he's used, whatever he's done, maybe the Ganti's and the Diyas and all have helped us in saving lives, but, but whatever, I think immunity. I think what uh, we must realize is that some of the slum po populations have probably been exposed to some form of coronavirus. You know, during the past, because we do know how they say, and probably that has given them some form of innate immunity, which has blunted the effect of the corona. That's what my personal belief is. I've had no medical proof to prove it. I think genetic uh, predisposition as well, because the same coronavirus in a 90-year-old man uh, who goes absolutely asymptomatic, whereas uh, a 40-year-old man will come have a torrid cause and not make it. So I think it's not been age, and, and yes, we do count obesity, diabetes, various other comorbidities. Yes, the older population has died much more than the younger population. One thing we do know is that probably there is something that the ACE inhibitor, which we, we talk in medical terms, is probably absent in the children. And that's why the children are the, probably the least affected. The ones who get affected get this multi-systemic involvement and they are very, very few and far in between. But I think case fatality rate, if we were to calculate all our numbers, because we are not even testing as much as the US is, then our case fatality is very, 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 very low. Uh, we've lost a few, unfortunate, but then so has the rest of the world. Yeah. We've acted early. We've had lockdowns <coughs> early. And sometimes there's always been a challenge. Do you think lockdowns were necessary? And do you think we should continue to lockdown? Lockdowns were never to prevent uh, the spread of the virus in a, in a country as diverse as India, as populous as India. It is only to prepare ourselves better. That's what my personal belief is. And I think we, we probably got ourselves prepared <coughs> far better. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, 40 to 50, uh, 50 to 60. Like I said, the older older ones are probably dying much. The younger ones, again, we are losing some people in that 40 to 50 span as well. So when they're coming a little late, I think if they're coming early, then probably we're being able to save them much more. Uh, did I answer all your questions? No, the men and the women thing. Yeah, the men and the women. Yes, men are more affected, but that just shows that Indian women are immune to everything. <laughs> the men. Sorry, just one related question, if I may. Uh, but 80 plus seem to be, uh, you know, the empirical evidence shows almost 100% recovery. Is there any reason for that in India? I'm talking of India now again. Uh, I, I don't believe that. We've lost a few who are, have been above 80. Like the, my first person who I came into contact with, I was not really in physical contact with. I was in the same hospital when he passed away was uh, Dr. Barinwala. I don't know whether you heard of him. He was a, a senior surgeon from Cefi. And unfortunately, we lost him. I saw a glimpse of him from really far away. And actually, that was my first thing because the media reports had started saying that I, I was quarantined and I was and actually I was I was actually willing to jump into the corona. So there was no question of quarantine. But we lost him the, the very day he came and did a CT scan in Sefi, was shifted to Hinduja and lost him the same night. So I think we lost a lot of the people in the early parts because we weren't giving blood thinners. Okay. I think that's that's where the, once the blood thinners came in and we started using blood thinners way before WHO actually recommended that we use blood thinners. So uh, I think that has saved many, many, many lives. We do know that remdesivir, toclizumab, all these various trials have proven that at least that they don't work. Plasma again came with a big bang. We again know. So it depends when you initiate treatment. I would say that please use pulse oximeter as your new stethoscope. Keep it at home. That should be your new machine at home rather than a BP machine. Uh, 
the six minute walk and measuring your pulse oximeter is again very, because sometimes people have stayed at home thinking they're absolutely asymptomatic. And when they come to us, they come to us with a saturation of 50 or 60. And that's when we lose them. So if we are getting them in the first, like I've always felt there are three, three phases to Corona. The first 10 days, the second 10 days and the last 10 days. The first 10 days is when uh, uh, you hardly have any symptoms. You've just realized you've got Corona. You start taking medications, all your multivitamins, the steam and everything else. Between the eighth day to the 12th day decides your course of how you will go with Corona. Yeah, the second course, second 10 is the most crucial one. So either the second 10 will decide that you go home and live happily ever after, or you might go into an ICU or worse off. So the last 10 days, if you've been in an ICU, you might either recover or never make it out. Mm. The second course is what decides how you would do with Corona. So be careful around the eighth day to the 12th day of your Corona virus infection. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ritu, please ask your question. Yeah, a very impactful talk. Thank you. Uh, tell us, how did Dharavi lessen the curve? Uh, would you know how, how such a congested slum did manage to do it? I think they, they were very clever in how they controlled it. All right. Uh, one is they worked really hard in, in trying to pick up. So they went testing from door to door. And the other clever thing that they did is they packed off a lot of people from there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. they decreased the viral load generally. Uh, okay. Because otherwise, there was no way to prevent that uh, that onslaught <clears throat> that would come in Dharavi. I think uh, they they did the right things. They went out and tested all the people who were there as much as they could. And uh, the other thing was to try all the migrants left in batches. So a lot of those people who could carry the virus in the toilets and every other thing out there had left. So we, we had a mass exodus out of there. And I think that kind of just brought the Dharavi numbers down. So I think they did a brilliant job there. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Rahel. Rahel, we ask a question. Yeah, Mufi, uh, I have seen some of the work that you've done at Dome when I, you know, when I came over to meet you, and it, it's truly phenomenal. Um, I don't think in India there are too many comparable examples over the years of, of anything like this being put together in such a short span of time. So congratulations again. Um, my question is, you know, in the last 15 to 20 days, uh, at least with our testing, and I know that's true of a number of other private labs that cater to South Bombay, Bandra, you know, the parts of Bombay that that we test. And we've seen a dramatic drop in the uh, positive rate, and that's very encouraging. So do you think uh, that we are finally turning the corner and this is something that will sustain, uh, or do we still have a long road ahead? You know what, uh, Ryan? Uh... You've been testing all this, and now you've started doing a lot of the clear antibodies and antibody testing. What you would you would bear bear me out is that a lot of the antibodies are somehow turning positive, you know, without that person realizing that uh, they've ever been come close to someone with COVID or ever been cross infected and stuff like that. Yeah. So that probably tells us that the best way of neutralizing this threat would have been uh, immunity, right? Now, herd immunity can be acquired by two ways. One was uh, the the, the safest way, which was vaccination, but we, we do know we are far away from vaccination yet, at least a few months away, if not further. And we don't know whether this vaccine will work and how long it will work. And the other completely scandalous way or completely uncontrolled way would have been, of course, the uh, cross-infection from person to person. And all the tests done so far, the, the two studies done have shown that there's already close to a 60 to 70% in our slums um, immunity. The IgG virus is present in 60 to 70%. So it's just the close in, uh, habitation of these people has probably, like I said, I think maybe somehow we are more, more genetically predisposed to not reacting that badly to this virus. And we've kind of turned the curve just because of our herd immunity. I think what, uh, willingly or unwillingly, we probably put everybody into something like a, a, a closed space during a lockdown and sealed it off. So now you intermingle with one another, those who've had symptoms, not had symptoms, those who've, who've been extremely sick have been moved out, but the others who've had no symptoms and who've been cross-pollinating other people have, have spread around. And I think we've, we've probably reached, so every virus has a different to reach a herd immunity, like the R factor. 
the R naught is different, right? So for for the coronavirus, they say anywhere between around 60 to uh, 60 odd percent. So they say between 55 to 70 percent is the R that we are looking at. The multiplication rate of between around two to three. So if we've reached that, then that's why you're seeing the numbers come down across. In fact, the other day I met with the CM and with Mr. Takri, and I, I did tell them that the next wave that Mumbai needs to watch out for is the migrants coming back. Because they will come back after these uh, holidays and stuff like that, and after the Bihar election. So what I did uh, recommend to the municipal commissioner and to Mr. Takre was, so that whenever everybody comes back, use all your labs and keep them only for yourself and test everybody when they come in. If they're, if they're positive, move them out. If they're negative, isolate them for three days, test them again, and then allow them into Mumbai. Because that's the only probably way. That's what Delhi is not done. And Delhi, I think the numbers will get much worse uh, because the cold, the, the, the air pollution there will just get much worse. And I think they're talking about second peaks and third peaks. It's not second and third peaks. It's just that the first peak was not well controlled and it's just prolonging now. Uh, we have one final question from uh, Swati. Swati, please unmute, unmute yourself, Swati. It's really brilliant work you're doing, Mufi. I want, I've just heard that the children are just carriers and they don't get affected. Is that true? And I also want you to now tell us finally that, that if things are opening up, what precautions we should take? Because this gargling and all you're saying, steaming, just give the psychological, uh, uh, like it takes you know, fear away. But what should we do? So, uh, yes, uh, children are asymptomatic most of the time. They don't show any symptoms. Mildly, if at all, they will show some fever. Majority of them, 90, you can say 97% of them behave that way. And that is why they become silent carriers. You're quite correct, because we don't even know. And they intermingle with one another. There's no way they can wear their masks all the time. Most of their masks have all, got all these Disney characters, which are not real masks anyways. So they can't really be protected. How, how often can you sanitize a, a child's hand? So yes, they can be silent carriers and they can give it away. My only piece of advice to everybody is be vigilant. Don't let your guard down. Uh, we've got another six months to go with this virus. Please remember that there's no cure yet. There's no way to predict who will do well and who will not do well with this virus. So whilst we are there, let's treat everybody who comes in contact with us as a COVID positive patient. Yeah, it, it sounds really weird, but your best friends can probably give it to you. So. Let's not hug them, even if they're our closest friends. Let's keep social distancing from them. Let's wear a mask at all points of time. So let's say if you were to invite people home, right? Yes, by all means, invite people home. But try and make sure that you don't stick to one another. Don't share the drink from the same glass that the other person's having. Even if you're having shots and whatever, just don't get drunk enough to start sharing the shots from the same glass. Uh, try, and, uh, try and ventilate your spaces openly. So keep fans rather than having AC closed environments. Uh, please don't wear masks while running outdoors and stuff like that, because that's a complete sham. Uh, keep a distance from your next runner or from your next cyclist when you're going out, you'll be good enough. I think a closed uh, space is higher to get you the virus than an open space. So if you have good cross ventilation, the chances of you getting virus is very, very less. Again, the level of exposure. You know, when someone's coughing, we go away from that person. That, that person might have a silent cough. Uh, a person who will uh, infect you is someone who's breathing heavy, someone who's shouting, all right? So try and avoid uh, guests who, who want to raise their voice, whether it's political or whatever, let them do their discussions out in the balcony. Okay, so there's a chance of cross-infecting people inside. I think if we use these few basic rules, I think we should be good enough. I think it's time to open up our schools. I do believe so because kids uh, will have a lesser chance. Let's protect all our old ones. Let's really protect our, our fathers, our mothers, and, and uh, make sure that whenever you go into their room, you uh, please sanitize your hands. Uh, make it a pr practice that when you come from home, just go and have a shower yourself. Because simple soap water kills everything. You don't need UV filters, you don't need ozones, and you don't need all that various thing. If you are rich enough and fancy enough, you can have all that. I don't want to have one at home. 
So I don't think it's really required. You can wash your vegetables. You can order in as much as you want from outside. It does not give you cross infection, right? So don't worry what's coming in from outside. If you want a pizza, please order in. Just make sure that the pizza is brought out from the box. You wash your hands when you brought it out from your box and then touch your face. Try and avoid touching your face as much as possible. Uh, keep one of those uh, sanitizers with you at all points of time so that uh, it's more than 70% alcohol. That's all you need to be careful about. And wear a mask at all times. A three-layer mask is, is what is required. And stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now request uh, Satyan to give the official vote of thanks, please. Sure, with pleasure. Uh, Dr. Lakhrawala, uh, Dr. Lakhrawala, I can only say that the real heroes don't wear capes. They wear masks, white coats, and PPEs. And the real heroes don't fight monsters, they fight pandemics. We are all forever deeply indebted to you for your service at the COVID frontline, and there are not enough words to actually thank you. As a token of our appreciation, uh, for spending this evening with us. Uh, we will be lighting up a rural household using solar power. We will be sending you the certificate in due course. I have a couple of 